That's the magic of the Akata. Is the magic of the Akata. The escape from the VR. Talking about magic, you know, one, one of the things that a lot of startups have been struggling with is to find, you know, a way to monetize their superb startup idea. <coughs> and magically, somebody has developed a great tool to enable to understand the whole business, but how to generate, you know, revenues and have a sustainable operation within a startup. So one of these methodology is the business model Canva. It's like the tartara crayon of, uh, of startup today, but it's a, a superb foundation to really think about how to build a business. Uh, Bruno Wattenberg, which happened to be my boss, uh, is uh, an expert in that field. He's a professor at the uh, Solvay uh, Business School. He's a, a journalist. He's also uh, a leading the agency for which I work. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Bruno Wattenberg. Thank you very much. So, what is first, thank you for welcoming uh, me this morning. What is your level in the business model canvas? Who has never heard about the business model canvas? Still some of you. Who had a limited use of, uh, a limited experience of the business model canvas? Who's a pro of the business model canvas? You can raise your hand. <laughs> Okay, so uh, basically who am I? Ju uh, Ju introduced me. I started to use the business model canvas in 2009. In the beginning of uh, when they came up with this, uh, with this new methodology. And it was difficult for me to explain what was a business model to my students. Of course, I could talk about user-generated content, about business model 2.0, about subscription business model. But it was the hell of a job to explain easily to anybody coming from the street and willing to become an entrepreneur what was the business model and why it was so important. And then Osterwalder came with a methodology. I liked it. I immediately applied it uh, with my students and I think very suitable despite the fact that introducing you the business model canvas in one hour is an impossible mission. So let's go back to this guy. This guy is free man. And he's conducting a mission in the, in the year 2000, I uh, know, in the 90s, in India. And when he's coming back, he used this, this fantastic expression, the world is flat, and he's writing a book. And one of the things he explains is that if you want to understand the world of today, you must think business model. He's talking about flattener, the kind of thing making the world more flat. And he's identified plenty of flatteners, you know, around 10 or 12 flatteners. And among those flatteners, this notion of business model. And he explained, if you just pick the technology, for example, you cannot understand the flatteners. If you see today the complexity of the model with partners, strategic partner, non-strategic partner, co-creation, it's the hell of a job to explain how a company is making money. This is the reason that he's proposing that the unit of analysis of the new business would be the business, uh, the business model. So just take a look about this. My generation, we were turning 18, we wanted to have a car, and the car was so freedom. My son, when he got a car when he turned 18, he had no driving license, and it took him nine months to pass his driving license. It means that the usage are changing. You're not talking anymore about owning a car, but you talk about sharing a car, renting a car, and you see a lot of those little initiatives around of people not selling a car, not selling an asset, but proposing to use an asset on a different thing. You cannot understand all those proposals without understanding the business model canvas. So, when I went to school a long time ago, 30 years ago, what kind of tools we were using? Of course, we heard about market studies, focus group, we had the 4P of marketing, project management, because what you are doing somehow is project management. Landing page, that's, that came some, some years ago to test, and then finally business plan. If you take a look a little more in depth, market studies and focus group, huh? The problem, guys, is that when you test something very innovative with customers, they don't like it too much. What do we like? We like something better. We like more of what we know. So it tests raw, it tests bad in focus group. 
Market studies. Oh, do you want to make a market studies on something non-existing? Okay, if you see Job, Steve Job, you can bet on the iPad and feel that it's gonna work. You know Steve Job, you don't have deep pocket. So you have to find something else. If we talk about the project management, okay, but this should be something before the project management. You know, the project management is that when you know what to do and you know that if you do it well, it's gonna work. So it's a great execution tool. Landing page, okay, business plan. So, when I started my career, I've been, my, my professor explained me the business plan and explained me this fantastic story. Bruno, when you see, when after 10 years in an industry, Babson, when you see, you can see opportunity. You see an opportunity, ah, you, you evaluate it, you, you write down a business plan, you get the money, you push on the green button, and it works. It's not like this anymore today, and you will not get money for this. So, once again, you can link business plan to project management. Business plan is a fantastic tool to execute, but something must take place before the business plan. So, let's go back to this famous business plan. What is the meta purpose of the business plan from your point of view? What are the reasons you people are currently trying to write a business plan? Answer, why are you writing a business plan? To get money. But, okay, I, I don't get it. Why people will give you money if you get a business plan? What's the reason behind it? Potential. To Sorry? It's a potential. It's a what? It's a potential. Potential. Oh, okay, so with the, reading the business plan, I can have an idea about the potential of your project. Number. Ah, oh, numbers. So trust. 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 Value. Value. So, we agree that an idea has no value. A business idea has no value. I have my friend Jack, is calling me every six months. Hey Bruno, I have a fantastic idea for a business. We have to see each other as soon as possible. Jack never started business. Because he just has an idea. He doesn't know to transform an idea in a, in a business opportunity. What's the difference between an idea and an opportunity? You can evaluate an opportunity. And two levels of evaluation. Risk and profit. So, the business plan, the meta purpose of the business plan is decrease the risk. But you guys are really pain in the neck. Why? Because you innovate. You're inventing things that are not existing. So how can we benchmark? How can we take a look about the market? There is no market yet. So the only way to do it is to be very creative using modern tools and to test as soon as possible. You know, and it's the test that will decrease the risk. If we agree that the business plan aim to reduce the risk, what does this mean? That what is better than a business plan to decrease the risk? It's a lot of tests. And the business model of Canva will help you to identify what do you have to test and how to test it. Of course, you didn't mention it, but it's also a communication tool. And then it's an execution tool, fantastic execution tool. Okay. Don't use the business plan in the beginning. Why? It's totally killing the creativity. It's content is intellectual fantasy. <laughs> Steve Bland. You know, and also brothers say that uh, most of the time when they open a business plan, it's full of intellectual fantasy. Because you, you put what you would like to, to happen and finally you start to believe in it. Cognitive dissonance. Not ideal to start, but great to communicate and execute. No business plan survive the first contact with customer. So, as soon as possible, the first test you have to do is to prove a business. Does it sell, even if it's non-existent? And you are fantastically gifted compared to the old people like we. Because at our time, it was difficult to have prototypes. Today, with the multimedia, you can show the value. You can let the people, the future customer, understand what value <coughs> you can provide to them. It was not possible before, okay? So in fact, what happened is that the business plan is great for this part here, not for this one. For this, you must something. You must use a more versatile, a more flexible, a, most agi a more agile a tool. So yes, let's take a quick look on this. Hey, I've got a great idea for a business. That's exciting. Tell me about it. 
I've developed a chemical isomer that links to volatile organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in a nanotube coating. Huh, that's a little confusing. Can you dumb it down for me? Sure. What I do is I take a proprietary isomer that I developed with a thicker acid wash that hollows out the carbon bonds and replaces them with a nanotube wrapping. Okay, so I guess it's pretty technical. Oh yeah. I've been working on this isomer for nine years. So what's the business idea? To sell it. <laughs> Everybody will want one. What for? So they can wrap their volatile organic compounds. <laughs> mm, I think you might be a target customer. I don't think I need to wrap my compounds in a nano too. Well, maybe not you. So, for people who buy it, what's the value you are providing them? <laughs> I've developed a chemical isomer <laughs> of organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in a nanotube coating. You've said that already. This is getting annoying. Why should anyone care about your isomer? I spent nine years on this. I know that. Okay, pretend I'm an investor. How can I make money off your product? By selling it. You're a smart guy. I try not to think like a scientist. Think like a business person. Okay. Value chain. Production. Term sheet. I have to go now and answer that. That's not your... Okay, what's wrong with that guy? Have you, do you have the impression that some, some time in the beginning you were behaving a little like that? No? Yes? What's, what's wrong? What is missing? The customer, you know? What else? The value, where is the damn value? And if you don't understand the customer, if you don't like the customer, if you don't have the empathy, if you don't take a look at the customer like an you know, anthropologist, you know, how can you have the empathy and the understanding to know how to build value for that guy? This guy has no empathy. He's just crazy about his technology. And technology, you, you, investors are not buying technology. But most of the time, not for you kind of guy. You are technology user. You are using technology to create value. The value must be well present and you must be able to quantify the value. Okay, let's go back to the definition of uh, a company. You know what it is. We're going to go ahead. But company, be, remember, company are organized about business model. So what a business model is likely, it's this. It's the thing you don't see. But without what you don't see, it just doesn't work. So your mission is to understand what is behind everybody can see. Okay? So remember, if you want to define briefly a business model, is our company creates value, our company deliver value, and our company capture the value. If we go back to my example of mobility with the cars, just imagine the different types of value creation you have just to move people. Just understand the different types of de uh, the delivery of value. Internet changed the role of the game. And by, by the end, capture a value for the cars. You can buy, you can rent, you can share. You know, you can have a subscription model. You have plenty of opportunity. One of the greatest problems that you will face during this year, Hackathon, is the first pattern you see, you dive in this pattern. You know, we have some interesting studies explaining that the people starting a business they do copycats. So most of the time you will copy what you have seen consciously or unconsciously. So you have to get rid of this diktat of, the, uh, of the, the known pattern and try to recover your free will by playing with your methodology. This is one of the, the objectives also of the business model canvas. If you take a look on all those companies, they all innovate by the business model. Quick look, and I read for you. Between 2012 and 2014, over 70 <coughs> companies globally valued at more than 1 billion were a startup with new business models that were unique and transformative. During the same period, most business model innovators have managed to produce consistently profitable return with average revenue gain between 100 and 500 person. The key to this success story has been connectivity and convergence with 50% of new startups launched on mobile platform. What does this mean? If you have a good idea, you have to embed it in a nice business model, the right business model. And you know, there is not one business model, there are plenty of, of possible business models. You have to search, so it's really a quest. 
testing, you know, changing business model and so on. So I just give you this slide and I love this slide. This is FedEx. And those are all the little startups trying to disrupt FedEx. Unbundling the business model of FedEx. Is it just one pattern? Is it just one type of business model? No, you're not limited. So the sky is the limit. Try to find the right business model. The good business model for your customer, the good business model suiting your value proposition, you know, and, and not just the one copycat that you, uh, uh, that you have found. So this is ba basically a surgeon kit for, uh, uh, you know, uh, during the war of independence in the US. And this is today. So what do you want to do? Still use the same old business plan things, uh, you know, sequential left brain, or to try to use new methodology. One of the you know, other interests, you are, you are working in team, and people are coming from different horizons. So what happens is that you don't speak the same language. One of the great assets, the great added value of the business model canvas is that quickly you speak the same language. Okay, let's go in the business model canvas. Nine blocks. Nine blocks. I can explain any kind of company with those nine blocks. I can explain even yourself. I can explain Marine, what is the, the, the resource and competence of Marine, what is the value proposition that she can assemble, who are the customer segment, how do they reach the customer segment, employers, and so on. So you can modelize any kind of human activity in the, those types of uh, business models. So very quickly, value proposition, it's the bundle of value that you are offering to a customer segment. Here, it's not you words. It's the words of the customer segment. If I love my customer, if this guy is my beloved customer, if I understood him, I will write a right value proposition with his words, not my words. And I will describe the segment to, this gen to whom this gentleman belongs. Okay? Then we will have the channels. Oh, this, oh my beloved customer will know I'm existing. Or will he be able to evaluate the value, to test the value, to decide to buy and pay and get delivered? and having to start the sales service. What is my strategy to get my customer? With my cost of acquisition of a customer. If I would be in the jury, one of the very first questions I would ask you is what the cost of acquisition of acquiring a new customer. Customer segment, we have seen it. How do you capture a fraction of the value that you are creating? Then, what are the key resources you have? Then. What are the key activities that you have to conduct to bring this value proposition to this customer segment? And if there is not a perfect fit between the key activity that you have to conduct and the resource and competence you have, who is your partner? Two types of partner, strategic partner, non-strategic partner. And then finally, the cost structures, representing the use of the resource, the activities, and the key partner. Okay? I put you also, because I will send you the slide, a lot of uh, different types of um, a business model. Affinity club, brokerage, bundling, cell phone, there's plenty of very interesting types of business model. So, so just don't test one. Test the one that fits the best, the, the, the value proposition you're able to propose to the customer segment. Okay? So here it's another way to see it. And I have a little movie for you. I just click here. This is the business model canvas. It's just what Becca called me to craft a powerful business model, and it can do the same for you. Let's dive in and see how it works. There are nine essential building blocks that make up any business model. When you get all nine blocks working together, you'll have answered the fundamental questions any business model must solve. We'll start here with customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. Channels describe through which touch points are interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the types of relationships you're establishing with your customers and how you're acquiring and retaining them. Pricing mechanisms through which your business model captures value are documented under revenue streams. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. So you can describe the infrastructure you need to create, deliver, and capture value. The key activities show which things you need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself, nor will you perform all key activities. But once you understand your business model's infrastructure, 
you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. Any business model can be mapped this way. Nine building blocks working to reinforce and strengthen each other. But before you make a model for yourself, it helps to see what a breakthrough business model looks like in action. Like this one. Low-cost airlines revolutionize air travel thanks to their disruptive business model. Let's first look at their value proposition. A low-cost airline offers ultra-cheap flights to their main customer segment, budget travelers, by adopting a no-frills policy. And this leads to additional revenue streams, because customers pay for their ticket and additional fees on items like food and drink, priority boarding, and luggage. The airlines save even more money through their choice of channels, selling only through call centers and the internet making for efficient, if not always convenient, customer relationships that are automated and often impersonal. Okay, that covers the right side of the canvas, the part everyone can see. The left side of the canvas is what's going on backstage. Like their choice of key resources, they reduce maintenance and training costs by using a single aircraft model for the whole fleet. And they only fly to cheap airports where it's cost efficient to land, or where they even get paid to touch down. Planes that do land have quick turnarounds, so they get back in the air earning money as quickly as possible. And they form key partnerships with others in the travel industry, like car rental, hotel, and insurance companies. Finally, under cost structures, all maintenance, training, airport, and call center costs are trimmed to their lowest levels. All of these pieces working together make their fares almost impossible for traditions. Okay, no, be careful. Each of you in the room has starts from one part of the business model canvas. The first was is the first one, the first origin is resource driven. You are very good at doing something. You get great competence and know-how and you decide, you dream, say I want to build a value proposition for my customer and get rich. Alright, fine. <coughs> do I like to coach those people? Yes, I do. A lot. Then you have the customer driven. The guy is been he belongs to a, an industry for 10 years, 15 years. And it was about 10 years he sees a pain point, an unsatisfied need, an unsatisfied desire in the industry. And he decided to start from here and uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to solve it and to make money. Do I like to coach that guy? Yes. He knows the customer segment very well. He knows the solution. I will have to coach him on that side of the canvas. For him, resource driven. He would like to have a Rolls Royce. I will tell them that the customer seg tell them that the customer segment is probably too small for a Rolls Royce, but there is a very interesting type of customer segment that we can test. And then there is the, that guy. That guy wakes up in the morning and he says, "Wow, I have an idea. I'm dreaming about that product." And it's not a value proposition because he doesn't know anything about value, and he doesn't know anything about the size of the segment of the people who would, work, would like to have this. And he doesn't know how to produce it. If you are in this situation, you have to do twice the work. On the customer segment first, and then on the production. All right? So, I like this definition of startup. And please remember this all your life. A startup is a temporary organization. So, when you start, you're not a company yet. No, 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 no. You are searching. You are a researcher in a lab. And you're searching what? A repeatable and scalable business model. It means that you have to test, test, test and, until you can say, okay, no, I'm ready, my value proposition works, I know how to deliver, give me the money and I can scale up the business and I know something about it. Okay? So you have to be searching and you must have the mindset of the researcher in the lab. So, in fact, you can use the business model canvas to test plenty of things. In each of the blocks, you have two or three hypotheses, two or three assumptions that you have to test, okay? So I will show you a, a quick movie. The story is, a, a nice story will fix the, the, the things in your head. A group of students competing for a business model comp competition, Harvard business model competition. They just have an ID, and they will go from the ID to the opportunity using the business model canvas. You know what's a pivot? Who knows what's a pivot? Who doesn't know? A pivot is that you're making, uh, you're testing. You made assumption, you're researching the lab. You made the assumption, you design a test, you conduct the test. Does it confirm your assumption? Yeah, go ahead. It doesn't confirm your assumption, you, you will not give up. You have to pivot. During this weekend, you have to pivot. You have to conduct tests and pivot. Okay? So, let's go.
In the beginning, the sound is not that good. Sorry. We're Alan Baby Monitors, and we want to share the story of how this stock is bringing you parents peace of mind. So our story starts with Tanner, working in the hospital. He works with technology, pulse oximetry. You've all seen this, a little red light in front of your finger, monitors your vital signs. He found working with this day in, day out, there was pain with it, the heat experience, and that pain was the core. Do you agree? Do you agree? The cord is a pain? Yeah, it's a pain for who? Sorry? The nurse, the patient? Okay, what do you do? It's an assumption, be careful. It's not an ID, it's an assumption. How do you test? Talk to nurse. And found that patients didn't like it. He found that nurses didn't like it. It got tangled up, it got in the way. So he assumed that other nurses would feel the same way. So he went ahead to test that assumption. He thought, what if we had a wireless pulse oximeter? We could have nurses use it, and we could sell it to the hospital. So in validating that, he went out and talked with 50 Stop. nurses. Can I have my, my full fit on, on the, on, you, you drop it on the, yeah. yeah, because I want to have the message, sorry. It's um, the ideal, the ideal result. Okay. So we learned a very valuable lesson. Your user is not always your customer. Sorry. Even though we found a user who didn't like it, it got tangled up and the way. So he assumed that other nurses would feel the same way. So he went ahead to test that assumption. He thought, what if we had a wireless pulse oximeter? We could have nurses use it and we could sell it to the hospitals. So in validating that, he went out and talked with 58 nurses. Who's investing? Come on, the ID is validated, no? Who's investing? User is not a customer. You have to talk to the one having the money in the pocket and having the pain and solving the pain by giving the money. The hospital. The hospital. He found a really good response rate. 93% said they wanted to see this over the existing technology. However, going back to the hospital, talking with administrators, he got a very different story. This was not a pain for them. It was about money, and it wasn't cost effective for them, and so they said no. So we learned a very valuable lesson. Your user is not always your customer. Even though we found a user that loved the idea and wanted to use it, they did not have purchasing power. And if you have a user and a customer, of course you have to create value for the user and you have to create value for the customer. Otherwise it doesn't work. So you have two types of value proposition. All right? And so going to the yellow, it goes back to red, unvalidated. So they're not a customer. We had to move on somewhere else. Sorry. This thing cost a thing and it only took about a week to validate. So we knew that we needed to pivot. Pivots. Kurt Workman had experienced firsthand in his family the pain that comes from a child being lost to respiratory failure. And so he thought, what if we pivot to the same technology in an in-home setting for infants who can monitor vital signs, blood oxygen levels, heart rate, and report that to a parent, where if there's an emergency during the night, it will alert and alarm the parent, giving them peace of mind knowing that they'll have that type of alert. He had found, in addition, that SIDS is the number one cause of infant death in the United States. You understand the pain? You understand the value, you, or you feel it. Sudden death, it's a mort subit du nourrisson, and in the Netherlands, weak dot. Okay, so what do you do? You just have an assumption. It has no value. It's like the guy in the, uh, in the, for the first video. What do you do then? Test, test, test. test, test. To whom? <coughs> you build a prototype, yes? Mm -hmm. Who said yes? They have a prototype. They have a prototype, they have nothing. It's a Bunch of students just uh, dreaming. Yeah. They will do some uh, survey of the people, not not prototype. Not prototype. Yeah. First, the customer. Yeah. Proof of business before yeah. proof of concept. Yeah. It's often respiratory related, which increases parents' anxiety a lot. In addition, there's four million babies born in the U.S. every and year. So at that size, we figure and assume that's a really big pain. I bet a lot of other parents feel this pain. We went out to test that, that assumption. We started with our assumed, our assumed solution, which was putting the technology into a smart hand clip for the own baby, and wirelessly send that information to a relay station, which was capable of alerting the parents of those in emergency, as well as pushing the information onto a smartphone for convenience. So we completely pivoted from our original idea. 
We started focus on, focusing on creating value in a new customer segment for parents in the home setting, helping bring that peace of mind. That's the mantra. So we knew there were two types of risks we'd be facing in this. Market risk, we'll just want to buy it, and technology risk, can we build it? We tackled market risk first because it was easier to get to and it was more important. People my age would say, oh, I need a prototype. You have to give me money to do a prototype because otherwise only want me to do it. So give me 50000 100000 dollars then I build a prototype and I can go to my customer. I'll just, I'll just, otherwise, I can validate anything. This was 20 years ago. It's over for you. So you will not get a prototype. But we, you, will, you will use any kind of means in order to show the value and to let perceive the value to the potential customer you have selected. And then you will validate. And then if it's validated, you might make money. Okay? So you tackle the market risk first. Pop before pop. Prove a business before proof of concept. We initially surveyed 105 mothers, and we found that on average, they gave us an 8.5 out of 10 on wanting this product, proving the technology was great. 96% said that they would use this technology. We got a lot of responses like, this is awesome, I want to buy one now, and take my money now and start selling it. We knew this was very early validation, but it at least pointed us in the right direction. We really validated this idea when we took Who's investing? Uh, who's investing? The customer? No, no, but who is that investing in the project at that stage? Let's imagine you have 12,000 bucks, 12,000 dollars, and you might have invested, it's an inheritance from a whole town, you can lose it. Who's investing the 12,000 now? Family, the family, family. Family, friends, school? No, you would not invest? Why? There is no prototype. Okay, at this stage, if you invest in my project, I give you 45% of the share. Okay, you do? You do. Okay, let's three three people in the room do it. Right? Put the idea into a class project. For which we built a website, we made a video. The video in reality at the time was nothing more than just smoke and mirrors showing what the product could be or what to do. Could we put it up on the website. And it leaked out. We didn't The rule is what? Use the smallest amount of resource to show, to do something, to be able to show to the bill of customer what the product could be in order to test the assumption in the business model. Okay? So, what they have done, they've been to the Brico, you know, they put a plexi with a film on it, and they taped a video for YouTube, and they had a landing page, and they put the video on the landing page. What do you see on the video? It looks like it's during the night, the socks is not existing, it's not a prototype, it's just nothing. And they have some uh, Photoshop, some uh, pictures for the, the iPhone to, uh, to give the, the perception to the future user, the beloved customer, that they are exporting XML files somewhere and, sh and showing the results. Okay? And 10 for this, so they got picked up by 40 news agencies and 13 different countries. So, a lot of people picked up the story. And because of that, we received over 500 emails in our inbox. Most of these were from parents begging for the product, saying we, we want the peace of mind you provide. We're not sleeping well at night. We're willing to buy a prototype if that's all you have. And so... Who's investing? Still the same one or somebody else is investing now? Oh, we have some more people interested, but sorry guys, but know that it's validated, you only get 35%. Can we agree with that? But you, okay, but why do you get only 35%? Every step that you do playing that game reduces your risk and reduces the risk of the investor. What's the aim of the business plan? Is to reduce the risk. What's the aim of the business model quest? Is that each stage reduce the risk. This is the reason you were taking a lot of risk in the beginning. No, you get less liquidity. Make sense? Okay. So what are you going to do now? What do you do? You are you are a team or you are coaching them? What do you do? Pre-order. Pre-order. Wow. No, no, no. I want to do revenue cost structure. Revenue cost structure. You start to dig in the price. Yeah, yeah, I need to know how much you can sell this one and how much cost to make. Uh, yeah, I can feel you feel it's, uh, you feel something. Oh, no, I see the stripping is on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, great. And some this, people this want some people want to do pre-sales. Pre mm -hmm. Just yes, they have something. What is, it's funny when you watch this movie because at that stage you're going to start to make mistakes.
because they have something to lose. Before they had nothing to lose. They were purely on effectuation. You know? And now they start, oh, we have something to lose. They will start to copy the, uh, uh, the, the big boys. From that, we feel we really validate that yes, there is a pain here. These parents want the peace of mind that this can provide. In addition, we had 15 distributors around the world reach out to us. Among these, one from our major competitors said they're willing to drop that account, which brings them $2 million in revenue per year to pick up our account. The second that's moving forward the fastest wants to do $50,000 in pre-sales to get this into their market the quickest. The great thing is all of that validation, it came from virtually building nothing at that point. And so we feel that indeed, yes, we did validate that there is a pain here and there is a customer that can serve us. That only cost us $220 and took about... Who's working in the large company here? Who's working in the large company here? How long to achieve at that stage? And how much money? <laughs> Two million. Two million. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Up to you to so our next question was, how are we going to reach our customers? We initially thought through hospitals. But um, after talking with pediatricians and others, we realized that the best place to sell it would be in the retail location. When looking at how much it was going to cost us to make our product, we realized that um, at the end, the customers would have to be buying it at around $200. Our question was, are we really creating? Why do you do this? Once again... How much people will pay to pay? Sorry? I need to know how much people will pay to pay. We know people want black. We don't know how much they're actually prepared to pay. For them yeah. the it's, it's the key, it's the key uh, question. How do you test that? Back to customers. Yeah, back to the customers. Yeah, customers. Yeah, yeah, all the pre-order emails you got, ask them how much you would give you in the Right? And what is the question you're going to ask your potential customer or those sending emails? Well, you make a multiple choice. Would you pay 150, 200? No. You ask them how much they're willing to pay. How much they're willing to pay. And that's a good question. So, by the way, at this stage, who's investing? You're still investing, but no, nobody else is, in this, is deciding to put this 12,000 grants or bucks or euro? That's a good deal, though. <laughs> that much value. Um, so we ori originally thought and assumed that we would have to rent the product. Our initial survey was pointing us in that exact same direction. Um, we got out of the building, went and talked to people over Baby Darf, and they told us there's a huge span of different products um, as far as price goes. And that um, the, most that the ones that were being purchased the most were in the $200 range. We didn't believe the lady when she told us this, so we called 33 other baby stores, and they told us actually the exact same thing. We were completely wrong. So it's interesting because what they do is they, they think by analogy, they compare, mm -hmm. they see what's the actual value of the value proposition offers on the market to make a comparison. If they see that the av on average uh, a baby phone is, is you know sold at around two hundred dollars, probably they create a little more value. They can explain the differentiation. Differentiation desensibilize the price. So this means that they probably could sell it over two hundred. But it's not enough. It remains an assumption. 71% of the baby monitors being purchased today are in the $200 to $200 or $250 price point. Um, and we learned that surveys can also lie if you don't word it correctly. We were asking what would you expect to pay, but when we started asking what's the maximum you would pay, that completely changed the result that we were getting. Um, we also A-B tested this on our website. People thought that they were purchasing the product when they clicked on the reserve button at different price points. This allows us to find out what the elasticity of the demand was and find our demand curve and find the... This is just fantastic. Because, you know, I'm 51, and on my time, it was just impossible. You just had to conduct long, you know, long interview with a lot of beloved customer, potential beloved customer, and the answer was not good. If it was very innovative. So, this is fantastic. They just let it leap, you know, with YouTube and so on, they get a lot of visits on the website. They, they let it go and they change the price every five minutes. 
every five minutes. And they see what happened. They see the reaction of the people. So they have an elasticity of the demand based on the variation of price. It's fantastic. It's not an assumption. It's really, you can maximize the price. See, they were not convinced they would create for $200 value. No, you are at 299 and it's the max profit based on this curve. So it's just fantastic because remember what I said, your job shifting from an ID to an opportunity is objective A, reduce the risk and objective A, the potential. Here you reduce the risk on the price and it's somehow scientific and with a great sample of people. On my time, when I would, was clicking on the Excel sheet for sales, I could see that the people, they did that. Uh, okay, that price and that's that much, that much sales. And no idea about how to, to attract a uh, customer. Profit maximizing price for $299. Um, so we in fact were proved wrong and luckily we will be able to sell the product. This cost us $30 in three weeks. Um, the next question was, could we build it? And that went right with... Uh, Think about Siemens, Philips, building the same thing all along. Okay, now we can start to talk about the technology. Our next technology risk. The two factors that we needed to prove out was pulse oximetry and wireless transmission in this usage. was first in wireless transmission because it was easier. We built the proof of concept. It cost us $300 and uh, seven weeks. It was able to do everything that we wanted it to, even though it looked kind of ugly. Um, after proving that, the next question was, can we create pulse oximetry specific for infants? Um, so we went back to the hospital, we interviewed the nurses, we watched how they were using uh, the product, or the, the current pulse oximeters, and we realized that our design wasn't going to work. For technical reasons, we had to switch to a more sock-like design. Um, we tested that sock-like design with uh, over 120 hours of testing. We did it in 26 different homes and uh, seven overnight tests with parents. We were happy to see that with our new design, we could in fact build it. It cost us $500 in 12 weeks of working on that. Our next question, which unfortunately we didn't learn this until later in the game, was that we needed FDA clearance on this product. And the first person we talked to said it was going to cost them over a million dollars. Um, we had to figure this out. We talked to 16 professionals. We even talked to the labs that we need to work through. And we know it's going to cost us at maximum $200,000 in 13 months. We validated that, and uh, it only cost us $200 in three weeks. But at this point, this validation was really. Here it's becoming interesting. Because they want to participate in the business model competition. And they want to do something that's something immediately. So they ask, what if we scrap the alarm? If we scrap the alarm, we don't have to pass the FDA. Yes, based on what we have, no, we're going to have investors. And they got some. <coughs> but then they say, we don't want to wait seven months for the approval of the FDA. So we want to start immediately. Why don't we scrap the alarm? What do you think about scrapping this alarm? As it's the, the most important element from my point of view. And probably from my point of view, my beloved customer, that this is really the differentiator. What do you think? Would you scrap the alarm? How, how do you get peace of mind? <laughs> no. Who am I? I'm not God. Test it. Test it. So let's grab the alarm and see how we benchmark the value proposition with the existing baby phone. Baby phone, you get the sound or you get the movement. Nothing else. Here, you would have also the information I get on my on my Fitbit. Would it be would it interest the parents? Let's make the assumption the parents would be interested and see how we react. So let's go back to the beloved customer and ask them. This is your job. You are a researcher in the lab. But if you want to understand how and validate your assumption, you have to go out of the building and talk to the customer. Hey, bittersweet. We said, man, is two hundred thousand dollars in thirteen months and all that liability is really running lean? Before we can even get a product in the customer's hands, could we not create something that would be more minimal and less risky and start with that in the, pro in the market? What was holding us up was the alarm. Alarm plus pulse oximetry means that you need an FDA clearance. We thought, well, what if we scratch the alarm? What could we do? Um, we said, well, we have the same product that you know, still give you all these really cool things, and we can play with that data really in, in a lot of interesting ways. And maybe we could call it our instant health tracker. This was completely unvalidated, so we had to go back and revalidate whether or not this product was that product. We could be different. So we grabbed our clipboards and we handed out to the retail location. And uh, we interviewed 81 people in person, gave four pieces of paper, and said, which one would you buy if you had to? Um, and they were, had to choose between our product and then the three other types of products that they could buy in those same price points. We were amazed when 20% of them said they would choose our product. Um, 
And we also learned so much about our customers. It's not a one-size-fits-all customer. In fact, uh, we really kind of have a whole range of customers. On one side, we kind of have like our, our hippie type mom that's a lot less worried about these types of things. And then you also have the, the mom that's on the opposite side of the spectrum. So you understand. In your mind, all the customers are the same. And they all react the same. It's not true. Large companies are occupying the big markets, the mainstream market. So don't go on the mainstream market. You only change to create a startup is to go at the periphery. When those, those are those niche, and hoping or being able to determine what kind of niche will grow. So the reason is that you, in the beginning, you see the market like an homogeneous playground. It's not there are different types of play, different types of people with different type of unsatisfied needs and desire. So it's a ghost curve. So the question they have, so would those new value proposition would fit part of the sub-segment of the market? The ones that were less worried told us things like, but we kept hearing over and over, I wouldn't want an alarm on this. This would drive me crazy. And it, it absolutely floored us, but we realized that our alarm version wouldn't even capture part of the market. And by starting with a the, with the health tracker that they liked already, we'd be addressing a completely separate market, not cannibalizing our own sales, and uh, starting with something that was a lot less risky to begin with. Um, as for the parents who weren't worried, we would launch our next product a few months down the road after we learned from some risk and uh, avoided some risk with our first product. So that was validated and we learned so much more about how our customer base is segmented out. Um, this cost us nothing and it took about three weeks to do. Uh, moving forward, we still need to validate a few things. We need to validate whether or not there's a few other uh, uh, subscription-like revenue streams. And we also need to find key partners that are uh, in operations and have retail experience. We got all this done for just under, or just under. I did guys think? Bunch of students, 24 weeks. Thousand and fifty bucks. Yes. But I mean, it's kind of missing the amount of time they are putting in, right? And time is also money. They could earn some money in the time of some other projects. But yes, but what about Philips and Siemens? They, they would have done it in 24 weeks? No, why? All those people discussing. Um, yeah, yeah. non entrepreneurial yeah. environment. All the roadblocks. I'm, I'm not expecting that by Sunday evening, by the end of the academy, you'll be able to do the same thing. What I want is to really instill in your mind this virus of effectuation. It means that in the world you are, with the technology you play with, there is no book written about the business model. You will have to invent it. So don't see just one business model. See the, the, the large, the vast major variety of business model. And therefore, you must have the tool to play with the tool and accept you have to talk to the customer, you have to, really, it's a gymnastic. Make assumption, design a test, cheat test, conduct a test, and fail as fast as possible. I have one of my good friends sitting is Carl, Carl is very rich. And he's succeeding all the startup projects he's, uh, he's doing. Why? Because Carl has deep pockets and time. So he, he invests in great people, and then they, they start to work, they fail, and then Carl puts money back. And then if the people are clever, but they fail two, three times, it works. I, I do get full of money, a pocket full of money. So you have to fail here. You have to fail by testing everything that can be tested. And then on a cheap way. Okay? So what is the what is the can I go back to my to my slide and you can put the, uh, the other movie. So uh, this is how to use the business model canvas. As you see. It's a tool that can guide you to the. Uh, so to, to guide your iteration and to be able to have one tool where everybody is quickly speaking the same language, customer segment, we understand what it is, value proposition, we understand what it is, and to identify which kind of assumption have absolutely to be uh, to be tested. Okay. If you can launch it, don't you don't have to put it on the. Uh, um, okay, so um, I, I, I get you to take a look on YouTube on OLEDs and see today the product, five pushers, the value proposition, sorry. 
the value proposition and how they save lives today. And they get, I think, seven million, uh, uh, seven million, yeah, seven million dollars investment first round in order to develop the product. And it's funny to see you two guys who have seen on YouTube and to to see them talking to customer and talking to investor. Okay. Encore, ouais, juste après le film. Ouais. I was supposed to use my mic, but my sons has gone with my HDMI. Yeah, so. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So basically, you have three tools to use. This is quite interesting for you. If you have the time to dig in the customer relation and who's the customer, what is the customer pain they are, you can use this, uh, this value proposition canvas, it's here. Um, number one reason for startups to fail, building something nobody wants. This is the reason you have to test as soon as possible if one is off customer. Okay, um, when you use this, it's observe first, make assumption, and then decide. Decide what you put uh, as gainer, uh, creator, or pain reliever. I will not go in, 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 in these details. The two mindsets you need today, being an architect, making assumptions, drawing business model canvas and throwing them away until you find something innovative. And then the researcher in lab. You must learn to verbalize assumptions, to write down assumptions and to imagine tests to, uh, to test it, uh, those assumptions. Okay, I put you a, course, a pitch course on SlideShare, it, it can help. Quickly a set of advice. Don't overvalue your ID. Clearly, understand the opportunity principle. Your job is to go from an ID to an opportunity and being able to convince the investor there is a level, uh, an, an, a, uh, a good level of, uh, acceptable level of risk, objectivated, mitigated by the configuration of your business model, you reduce the risk, and then that there is some profitability. This is a business opportunity. Make hypotheses and write them in a specific color. Use a new business plan in the business model canvas, specific color for assumption and hypothesis. In order that you make sure you know and you never forget, it's just an assumption. It's not a statement. It's not demonstrated. Design test, understand the pivot principle. Set of advice too. Understand the interest and limitation of the business plan. We talk about it. Use modern tool. Get out of the building, talk, talk to customers. You have seen to how many customers they talk. Yes, it takes time. Yes, it's impossible to do it today. But you can try to have early validation, you know, making polls, asking people on the social network, Twitter, and so on. Um, set of advice three, learn to describe the customer segment. Use the persona. You know the persona principle? You know, you name your beloved customer. If, if this is Jack, I close my eyes and I, and I explain my beloved customer is Jack. Jack is 32. He's a, this, 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 and this, and I make sure everybody in the team sees the same Jack and talk about the same kind of persona. It's from Jung, uh, the psychologist Jung. Quantify the customer pain. You, will, you don't want to do that. You say, yes, of course there is a pain. Try to quantify the pain. If you don't quantify the pain, I will ask you to quantify the, the, the value proposition. So you must tell if you, increase, if you add in speed, emotion, Time, I don't know what, but what kind of value do you create? And if you create value, try to measure it. If you measure it, you will be, it will be easier to put the price because you know the value you are creating based on the pain that is measured. Understand the mechanism of the value proposition. The part in the middle of the canvas, it's not only the feature of this product. What do you think from your point of view is the value of this product? What is it? How much does it work? How much does it cost? Price. How easy is it to use? Yes, how easy is it to use? How much money you would pay for that? 30. 30, 30, 30 euros. Okay. Sorry? 10. Okay, you don't understand. The value is you can look at the people and change your slides so you can connect with the audience. That's, that's the, the fee. That's the, 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 that's the tangible value. It enables to on distance move your. Uh, are you slide. Is it the value for me? It can be a little bit greater. Yes. You, you, have the feeling you keep the connection. You yeah. keep the connection. Guy, you see how I teach. If I don't have this, 
I'm stuck behind this fucking computer and I can't connect with my audience. I, I, I have one and I even have spare batteries. If you remove me this, I can't teach. I can't connect, I can't play my, my, my beloved customer, my, my game with my beloved customer. So for me, it's worth more, more than 30 euro. So I'm a sub-segment ready to pay much more money for this. Who is the sub-segment for whom you create is the highest value? And how can you measure not only the tangible, exactly what you mentioned, but also the, ta the intangible, the, the emotion, the fact that I feel much better. I even have spare batteries if, it, if, if my battery are low. Okay? So, <laughs> tangible, intangible. Quantify the value proposition. If you quantify the customer pain, quantify the value proposition. Learn as soon as possible to pitch your project. Don't wait the end of the project to pitch it. Pitch it as soon as possible. Today, pitch it several times. And you will see how the pitch, when you will be pitching, and you say, oh, I'm saying bullshit. It helps. And in the next weeks, you, you, you warn the people you live with, you go in the bathroom, you close the bathroom, and you pitch in front of the mirror. It's a very good training. Uh, every morning, collect feedback, ask the right question, learn from your pitch. Set of advice five, don't wait the final business model to assess the finance side of the product. You should have an idea about the finance dynamic of the business model, because otherwise you cannot tell me it's the best business model. Learn to how to make a profit and loss on the back of an envelope, dynamic of cost, dynamics of revenue, and I have an idea. If I change something in the business model, what is the impact? Understand, okay, determine COCA, COCA, COCA. I mentioned it, cost of, Customer acquisition, okay? And elasticity demand price. There to study competition but also substitute. In the beginning you will lie. Say, no, no, Bruno, I don't have any competition. Okay, five pushers. <laughs> you have competition and or substitutes. And substitutes, most of the time, it's the, it's the one that is killing the, uh, the project. Okay? Uh, imagine design can do two types of tests. We talk about it. Proof of concept. Yes, I can deliver. Proof of business itself. And you start by the proof of business. And then be an anthropologist, psychologist, sociologist to learn from those tests. Watching people use the, uh, the value proposition and reacting. Don't say your hypothesis are conservative and so your financial forecast. Many people are saying this. No, no, Bruno, I've been very conservative. You know, uh, I don't care. You, I have two hypotheses. Uh, uh, I have a positive one and a negative one. Say, no, I don't care. Explain me on which figures and assumption this hypothesis is built. And then you give me one, and you demonstrate it, that it's as close as possible as the reality because you've been testing. Use some sensitivity analysis. When, I'm, when people are pitching in front of me, they, they are very passionate. They read my pitch course, and they are Bruno and now and so on. So. And then at a certain time, I ask them, OK, can you tell me the three deal killer hypotheses of your project? The three hypotheses that will kill your project if, it, if they, don't, they don't happen. And then they, it's the face change, and they start to talk to me seriously uh, about the, the big hypotheses they, they made, and they have not been talking about in the pitch. Know those hypotheses. Know the hypotheses that could kill your project. Um, plan some clear milestone, determine financing needs. Uh, search for the right mix of financing. Yes, that's, that's a little too soon. Don't forget the definition of an enterprise. Uh, sorry, yes, uh, an enterprise are based on business model and the definition of startup. Startup are temporary organizations searching for a repeated uh, uh, business model and scalable business model. That's the rule, fail fast, fail rough, fail cheap, and never do twice the same mistake. There are some great books, Running Lean, Startup Owner Manual, with 40 a checklist at the end of the book, Business Model Generation, Value Proposition Design for the Value uh, uh, Proposition Canvas, and I put you some web websites, and thank you very much. Some question. I just uh, spent one hour, a little less than one hour, I think five fifty nine minutes. Um, question. Yes. Uh, she has it on the USB key. It's her problem though. No. I transferred the problem <laughs> to the <monkeys> well. <laughs> So she will post it uh, you know, can be posted on slide share, I have no problem with it. Uh, uh, let's share it with the, 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 the largest amount of people. Other question. Quick other question.
Yes, what do you think about Indigo campaigns and so on to test your assumptions early on? Um, to put me the time. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very good thing, but you have to do your work before. You will not, they will not accept you if you cannot demonstrate that you have mm -hmm. done already a lot of uh, a lot of work. If you if you, if you just an idea, they will not take you. You must okay. be way ahead, and it's the ultimate test in order to validate if there's serious market traction and to measure it. Okay. So anyway, it doesn't prevent you from doing the. Uh, uh, doesn't prevent you to do all the process that we just have seen now. Other question, yes. Uh, market analysis. Market analysis. You gave some big number of tools, resources. Okay. Uh, I would like you to two minutes to see this based on this question. Okay. Can you turn to Marie? Marie. I don't know what you find things. Anything. Stick it to your laptop and worry less. Attach it to your keys and never be late. Drop it in your purse and you're good to go. It works very simply. Finding things with Tile is easy. Through the Tile app on your phone, you can track distance to your lost item. The app shows you as you get closer. And Tile has other features too. You can log into your Tile account on anyone's smartphone to search for your items. And... You understand the value? Mm -hmm. Is the product existing? I think so. Yes. It was five years ago. Yeah. Back then. Probably no. not. The, the prototype was existing, mm -hmm. but they were not ready to go in production. So they put a, a, an advertisement on Facebook and Google. I clicked on it. And I've seen it in the first part of the movie. In the second part of the movie, they were telling the people that they were not ready. Mm -hmm. But they, were, they wanted to, have, to build a community. So I sent it to my wife because I lose everything. <laughs> I do not lose everything. So I said, hey, great, can you, can you uh, buy me some? She sent me back an email and saying, okay, I bought you, I ordered you five. And then I, 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 I want to see the movie, I want to show the movie to a friend of mine. And I, we could see the movie to the end. And then they explained there are two techie guys from Frisco, uh, from Silicon Valley, and then they build a community, a prototype, and so on. They were typically in, a, in the crowd for a funding a campaign. I was a guinea pig. I was a proof Conan. <laughs> So what happened is that I asked my wife, say, hey, can, have you received an answer? I got a very nice answer. Thank you very much. We're not ready to go in production. You will be one of the first customers when we will be in production. And I never got it. Never got it. But they were able to test the COCA, cost of customer attraction, uh, uh, measure the drive, and, and measure the cost of customer attraction. And they went in production, finally. OK? Market studies. Yeah, some trends. Uh, so sites. You are innovative. There are no books. There are really few studies. No, no, there are macro studies, but not the studies about the value proposition you have for the market segment that you can reach. So you can have an idea of trends, but you will have to do the job and you will have to talk to the customer. I'm, I'm, good. I'm teaching the MBA, and we have the entrepreneurial lab, and a nice guy, 30, 35 years old, they got paid MBA, and we, for the first coaching we say, you don't receive the first coaching if you haven't pay, uh, if you haven't talked to uh, uh, ten customers, ten real customers. It's very hard. Yeah. You have to go outside. So nothing replaces the, con the contact with the customer. But you have to get in touch with the customer, having made the assumption, having understood the environment, having understood you know the uh, the playgrounds, the dynamic of the playground to ask the right question. But by the end of the day, go talk to the customer. What you will learn will be very important. And for me, it's important if you want to have finance, yeah, uh, if you are not capable of doing this, or will you be able to sell? Because the, 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 the team is the first uh, sales, sales rep of the, uh, of the startup. Okay. Yes? Yes? Uh, we are selling uh, something to the public administration. Yeah. We normally work with the uh, public procurement. Yeah. How we can uh, just sell them some innovation. Probably it's not possible. I had, uh, I had uh, a message from a person like you, Bruno Hell, who said that I have the best product, there is a tender, and they have to train a thousand euro of sales before uh, being able to uh, propose the, uh, the, uh, the offer. So the only way, no, no, it's, there are, are solutions, there are always solutions. Partner with an existing company, and be a subcontractor of the one entering the tender. And uh, if it's uh, if you propose them uh, to uh, a trial, or if you propose it at a premium, like they, they don't pay for the first pay. Very difficult. 
except if you have a minister of a public body who loves the thing and really will want to push, the civil servant, the one make, preparing the offer and everything, they will play safe. And safe is not playing with you. So uh, we, did, no, we did something in Brussels uh, some years ago with uh, uh, you know SaaS platform years ago, ten years ago, and, and we, we we put three companies together having an offer, three uh, uh, SaaS offer, and we offered the product for the uh, uh, all the, uh, uh, the public institution to use. It was one expenses, one with C a CRM. I don't remember what was it, the third one. And uh, but legally speaking, if I take a look on this, nobody would do it today. Because today everybody's uh, the regulation are very uh, sharply controlled and, and things like that. I hate it, but this is so. You better find a partner. You go to a partner. We have a no of tenders. You ask the partner on this thing. You accept not to win to make money because of the case. It's your business case, but you have to make sure to measure all the value added that you created, yeah. and that's a way to uh, to go on. on or you partner with the uh, Informatica Center, uh, uh, you know, the um, Center for IT from the region, for example. That's an alternative. That's an alternative. Cluster Software Brussels. Cluster Software Brussels is in contact with the CIFB, CIFBK, and that's the, 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 that's the IT platform of the region. Other question? Yes? Similar to this, how, how do you uh, think about if your product isn't for consumers, but it's for businesses. Great! It's even better, because that, that's a return on investment. You partner with your first company. First of all, the first, uh, the, first, uh, the first advice is when you are doing this, in the cost of the development, you review the test with the ID with my beloved customer. Okay? In this case, beloved customer being a uh, uh, company. Okay? So you develop the cost based on the test. And in the test, you validate customer claim, value proposition, and you quantify the value proposition. When it's done, you can visit the competitor from the one you tested and say, hey, hello, Mr. Nice to meet you, Bernard Wattenberg. We've developed a, a solution for exactly the company that I'm uh, curious. And you know, we have a big customer, we decrease the cost of this operation by 12%, uh, we decrease the risk by 20%, and we have a business case. Would you be interested to talk about it? Quantified value proposition, quantified pain, quantified value proposition, and we did it! So you, and we did it with a competitor of you. So you, it's not the fact that you go to a lot of companies, you no, 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 no. Read, read the case quantifier, both by Tipco. At a certain time, they were pitching all companies in all sectors. And they had this fantastic expression. I don't know if it's in the case, but I spoke to the founder. And he said, it's like we were throwing spaghetti on the wall until one sticks. And we didn't know why it sticks. So no, no, I have a strategy. Make a sub-segment. The sub-segment of the company having the greatest problem that you can solve. Then test, measure. And then go to the other saying you have already done it with the competitor. And, and then it's not an assumption. You have gone. It's a business. Yes? Uh, let's say you're building a software to make engineers more efficient. Now, would uh, you usually approach the engineers and ask them whether they want to have the software or the managers of the engineers? Because usually the engineers are the ones who benefit from it, but not the guys. He's, he's an engineer, that's, that's why I'm kissing him. Ah, okay. Even though I appreciate my. Uh, I appreciate you, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, very interesting. Uh, I think I tell you a quick story. I think Felix uh, Bramedi worked on this company. Uh, Renova, you worked on Renova? Relova, fantastic company uh, created by an MBA from London Business School, and the guy is managing fleets of locomotives. And he sees that those locomotive fleets are badly managed by the, uh, by the companies. And he said, I want to create my own business, and he's building a box that can be fit in the locomotive and to exchange data, to monitor data, and eager to act. Very basic problems. He developed um, the, uh, the, the box and the software, and there is a very nice panel. And he can, he can tell the company that there are, there are five types of savings he can make on the operation. I have the slides, we don't have the time to see, but it's a fantastic quantified pain, quantified solution. And he does it with the first customer. Small companies, 20 locomotives, diesel locomotive. And it works, the customer is very happy, but he hasn't measured anything. And then he goes to see Mr. Big. So after visiting the small company and being successful, he goes to see the big company. Unfortunately, he didn't measure the result. He knew the customer was happy, but he could not measure. He go and do a fantastic quantified value proposition for the company, 
based on what you learned on the, and the hypothesis because they have not been validated. And he, he go to whom? To whom is he talking to? Yeah, what type of executive? Yeah, plenty of executives. No, procurement is too... Uh, no, it's right. Procurement, it has, it has that in procurement. Because procurement will focus on other, other elements. So, he, by the way, he goes to visit the CEO. And the, the response, no, but it's the responsible of operation having the problem. Talk to the guy managing the operation. What do you think is the direction of the guy? He demonstrated that he can save two million five a year on the operation. Do you think that the guy will go with the proposition to spend, I don't know, half a million euro to save two point five million euro because he's managing battling the, the fleet of locomotives? Who has to pay? The CEO? The manager. Yeah. The owner. The accountant. The accountant or the CFO. So, in fact, you should have reached the CFO and not the CEO and say, good news for you both, my friends. I can save you 2.5 on, uh, on the operation. Are you interested? So we call this the DMU, the decision making unit. So they are the user and they are the one paying. Who has the greatest pain? The one who has to uh, increase the productivity of the locomotives or only the, um, uh, the CEO? So you're quite right. If you want to sell to engineer, you must understand the value proposition that's behind. And provided that those engineers are not uh, the, uh, the ideal person to talk, talk to the person that can recognize the value uh, you created. And this value, in this case, is a saving operation. Other question? Maybe we can move for our other question. Yes. Yes, a coffee and uh, Thank you very much.